I think that's a really important question. I'm glad you brought it up because most of our listeners, most of our supporters are not lawyers and don't have legal training and can't do this type of work. And that's reflective of the general public. But we all have a voice. This is Defender Radio. Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, presented by the Fur Bears. I got some incredibly kind responses to last week's New Year's rant, and I'm amped to have an awesome 12 months with you. I hope you'll consider becoming a patron of the show to get some exclusive content and help grow the show and support the Fur Bears. From a dollar a month to five dollars a month, you can help Defender Radio reach new heights. The goal for 2018 is 100 new patrons. I hope you'll help me get there. Visit patreon.com slash Defender Radio. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Defender Radio. Or click the link in this week's show notes to sign up. The law exists to protect everyone. And for advocates like us, that includes non-human animals. Canadian law isn't quite there yet. But the folks at Animal Justice are always working to change that. And pretty soon, you'll be able to hear a little bit more about the ins and outs of the legal fight for animals. Paw and Order, the new podcast from Animal Justice, is set to release its first episode this month. Executive Director at Animal Justice, Camille Labchuk, and board member and law professor Peter Sankoff will talk about the organization's cases, legal news that relates to animals, and more in this new show. It's an exciting prospect as the intricacies of law, especially animal law, are hard to communicate in brief media clips. This in-depth discussion format will be fascinating for animal lovers of all stripes. Before the holidays, I sat down with Camille, Peter, and Communications and Development Manager Shannon Milling to chat about the concept and planning for the podcast, how they hope it will help the animals, and what listeners can expect. We'll get to that interview after this quick message from our supporters. Looking for a parka that'll keep you warm in Canada's extreme winters and not harm the animals? Check out Woolly Outerwear, a Toronto-based, made-in-Canada ethical company that utilizes military-grade technology to keep you warm and help save the lives of animals. Portions of every sale go to support the fur bears and animal sanctuary. I embrace my wild side by wearing Woolly, and you can too. Learn about their commitments to the environment, the animals, and the people they work with, as well as how to buy at WoollyOuterwear.com or anywhere on social media. When did you first talk of doing a podcast for Animal Justice? How did that come up? So this was my idea originally. Um, We had this discussion. I'm trying to remember. We've been discussing it for a while. Yeah, sort of in a, we should do that. That would be fun kind of way. Yeah, so I I did a podcast um, at the early days of podcasting when podcasting was on in its infancy, literally. Um, It was 2006 or 2007. This was in New Zealand when I was living there, and we did a great little podcast. I absolutely loved it. It was called The V Word. So it was more about veganism uh, Mm -hmm. than anything else, but we brought in law perspectives and things like that. And we had like... 50 followers <laughs> there was, and, and it wasn't because we weren't popular. Nobody was, there was no iTunes distribution. They, none of these things existed. So it was yeah. really hard for people to understand what podcasting was. So that sort of died out, but I had a great experience with it. And I spoke to Camille about it and I said, look, at some point we really have to do this. And we've just been putting it off <laughs> just because we've been so busy. And uh, it's really hard for me, I think, and Camille to fit one more thing into our life. So we haven't yet figured out how we're going to do that, but we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. And you know what? There's very few animal podcasts. Yours being Mm -hmm. uh, one of the only Canadian ones. I think there's just a handful of others and animal law podcasts. That's even a more niche field. So there's really almost none of those. There's one good one in the States, but we thought people seem to be interested in this topic. And if we can do more to spread the word via a podcast, that would be cool. This is really just uh, my ploy to get to speak to Camille on a regular basis because we're in different cities, so we don't get to catch up as often as I'd like. So now it's like we're going to be talking every couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm very excited. About Forced that. communication. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> on the schedule. Once it's calendar, once it's diarized for me, then I know it's going to happen. So it's all about just really getting it into the eye calendar. More or less, yeah. If I don't diarize something, it's not going to happen. So now I'll have all these fixed dates where we're going to catch up and talk about all these issues. And I mean, we've been doing that for so long anyway. When we get together, we could really record a bunch of our conversations and just sort of like what we're talking about because we both 
we're both pretty, as you'll find out, we're both pretty free flowing personalities. I don't, I mean, I'm a law professor, so I really should be more careful. But when I'm talking freely, I don't do that. I, mm -hmm. I want to just speak in a casual, open minded kind of way and just express my opinions about things. And this is sort of a, a vehicle to do that. I don't see this as, you know, my scholarly work. This is a chance for me to opine sort of freely on uh, animal law issues of the day. And we've always had a good time doing that. So I'm hoping it'll be just as much fun uh, in recorded version. Well, and that's certainly something as a as a former journalist and with what I do now, having a lawyer say something that isn't necessarily like this is the total law, absolute rule, and I will stand up in front of a judge and say it is somewhat rare for me. So to be able to hear just that conversation take place between two legal professionals about that would be very interesting. And I think particularly to uh, the animal rights and uh, animal welfare communities at large. Uh, and I do have some questions about that, but... I wanted to ask about the name. So it's Pawn Order, which I absolutely adore. And you went about finding the name for the podcast in a very interesting and somewhat dangerous way, as we were saying before we started recording. So what was the, the process of determining what you would call the new podcast? Well, we have a you know great community of followers on social media, people who engage with our work. And we thought, if we're going to do this, we should, well, A, let them know about it, which we did. And we found the response was just overwhelming. And we thought, well, we're trying to come up with a name. Why don't we reach out to the people who already care about this work and see what they have to say? So we uh, threw out a couple of ideas and asked for their feedback. And uh, somebody on Twitter responded pretty quickly and said, paw in order. And we thought, oh, wow, that is a top contender. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we got all kinds of other submissions, too. Yeah, it was fantastic. Like there were, there were at least five or six viable names that I, we, we, and the funny thing is we came up with a couple at the beginning and like they were okay. And yeah. We, we sat around and brainstormed the two of us and we, we, they were okay. But the, the crowdsourcing was so much better. Like within an hour, I recall we were all there. Shannon was there as well. Yeah. And they were all just streaming in. Yeah, it was awesome. We were, uh, we were eating at Pure Kitchen in Ottawa and we were just checking the phone for the la next hour and they're just coming in. Um, it was really exciting to uh, to watch that happen. Yeah. So well, then we then we put the best ones to a vote. Well, and was there any worry that you would end up with the Bodie McBoatface podcast? I mean, that's, <laughs> anytime you crowdsource something like a name, it, that's like the first thing that jumps into my mind. Yeah. Uh, if that's what the the listeners wanted, we would have gone with Bodie McBoatface Animal Podcast. No, we're here to not. serve. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, the long-term vision or goal of the podcast, have you thought that out? I mean, I know when I started Defender Radio, it was literally, I just left journalism and wanted to still do something like that. And I had no idea what it was going to look like in six months, let alone now five years in. Uh, do you have any thoughts on where you're going with this ultimately? Well, I think we're sort of, you know, with launching something new, we, we might not know where it's going to end up right now. I mean, we have a lot of ideas about formats and different segments. And we've been working on a logo and all those little pieces that you need in the theme song. But I think we're all really open to, uh, you know, changing it as we go and getting feedback from people and making it into a product that people actually want to listen to and care about. And I know another part that's really important to us is making sure that we engage with people on the podcast. So we do plan to have a segment where listeners can submit their questions about animal law and we'll do our best to answer them and make sure that we can answer what people need to know on a daily basis. Yeah, so a large part of my work, um, both in writing and uh, in uh, in online presence, is trying to demystify some of the concepts that make animal law so confusing. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's like a book I'm working on is essentially all about that. It's about how to explain why things are uh, so... Sorry, I was going to... I don't know if we're allowed to swear on your podcast. Oh, yeah. I was say, okay, great. So I was going to say why things are so fucked up for animals. Like, yeah. why is it such a mess? And, and why can people not understand the results that take place? So I've done that already. Like, so I do these video blogs. And yep. I've done... I've posted a bunch of these online. And I find they get good response. So like when, when, when everything was going down with Bill C-246 last year, there was a lot of misinformation. There was a lot of misunderstanding. So I try and simplify it and try and put it out there in educational form. And... I see the podcast as sort of doing that. That's one of its visions. Like if I had to stress what, what I was trying to achieve through this, one of them is certainly to demystify and provide like, why is this happening? Like what is the background behind the background and how does the law work and why does it occur in this way? Because to be frank, I don't think the media gets it right. I just think, I usually think it's too complicated for the media to understand. And I think it's nice to provide a voice and explain it to people. And so this, the second part that I think is really critical is sort of providing a voice 
for the community to critique some of the things that are going on. So I think it's really important for Camille and I to be able to express our views and say, well, here's why this is happening and here's what's wrong with it. So it's really important to uh, put that voice out there and hopefully get people to, uh, to, to listen to it and uh, hopefully spread the message around about what's going on. One thing I would be curious about, and again, this is based on my uh, experience with my background, is is there concern that what you can say during a podcast can then come up when you are in court? Um, you know, my my caveman-like understanding of libel laws being what they are, and I'll often email Camille actually and say, hey, am I allowed to say this? <laughs> um, but is there concern of you can say, like, you'll as you said, you want to be very open and free-flowing about uh, a conversation on a very specific subject, if you then get up in court for whatever reason, is there a concern that a judge can say, yeah, well, you said this on such and such date? Well, it's it's an interesting point. I mean, I, I, I don't worry too, too much about that. I'm in sort of a unique position because I'm a lawyer slash law professor. I already have that concern. Yeah. <laughs> that concern is part of my daily life. Uh, luckily, in terms of animal law, it's a little bit less of a concern, frankly, because getting into the court on behalf of animals are pretty rare opportunities at this moment. But even if, if we do actually get into court, I, I'm not as worried about that. I, I think the types of things that I'm doing in court, when you're going to court and presenting a legal argument, you're really trying to structure the legal argument in a particular way. So, I mean, what, what, what you're saying right now, like literally I face that every day and I can't worry about that. I make arguments in court and I've had judges cite my own books back at me, literally. Like they're like, you know, but you say this and I'm like, well, I was saying that in a different context and yeah. it doesn't make, you know, necessarily here we're talking about something slightly different. You're always trying to play around that. But like that's literally happened to me. It happened in DLW. My own book sure. got cited against us, nice. right, for a proposition. And that, and like, that, for your listeners, was the Supreme Court case right. that animal justice intervened in right. the country's top court. Right. So they used my book as an example of why it shouldn't be done in a particular way. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to say? Like, I, I, I could explain to them that at that time I wasn't really thinking about this situation. But I, you just don't even do that. It's yeah. just, I, I don't think it's that much of a concern. I do think that the courts recognize that there are different proposi different roles being played by members of society. And when I speak out here... There's no question, like, we're going to be just as wary about libel laws as anybody else. Like, we have to be careful. Some of the things we would say in private discussions, say, about a particular producer or a particular industry, it, it is the kind of thing yep. you have to watch. You have to be a little bit more careful in your nature of criticism because when you're speaking in private conversation, you're letting yourself go. You're saying whatever. You can say this is totally messed up, and, and then they're, they're, they're butchering the, whatever you're saying, right? And then when you do it on the air, you do have to think about it a little bit. Your brain needs that check process to go, okay, well... Let me, let me be careful before I libel this particular group. Mainly, not even, even if it's not libel, who needs the grief? Like, who needs mm. the serious grief if they, they decide they want to take it on? Like, it's just not worth it to me. Yeah, sure. And then the other aspect to that is industries, of course. I'm sure monitor closely what you say on your podcast yep. and what we're going to say on ours, and we'll attempt to use that information against all of us at some point. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that being honest with what your goals are and what you aim to accomplish and being very clear that you're always going to be on the side of the animals is is valuable. Just being consistent about your beliefs and, and what you're putting forward as a perspective is the right thing to do. Excellent. And I want to have a little bit of tech nerd talk uh, for the podcast fans. Have you decided what your setups are going to be, how you're going to record? I'm getting some looks right now. We're looking at Shannon. Hey. <laughs> Uh, Shannon's our tech guru. Yeah, so clearly um, both hosts live in different areas of the country. Um, so they're both going to be using um, these really awesome Blue Yeti USB microphones. Yep. Um, that'll go right into the computer. They'll be recording through Zencaster. And mm -hmm. then we're going to have a WordPress plugin called Seriously Simple Podcasting that will not only host it for us, but also have the RSS feed and put a page on our website. So it'll be um, super easy that way. And in terms of producing the podcast, um, I have some background in radio. Mm -hmm. When I was um, studying for my Bachelor of Journalism at Carleton, I had some radio classes. So I'm going to be bringing all of that back and, um, yeah, doing my best to put it together and put it out there for everybody. Awesome. And have you decided on a host for the uh, RSS feed? Or are you going to do that manually? Um, the Seriously Simple Podcasting hosts it for us. Oh, okay. I've not yeah. heard of that one. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Um, I, I had made the, the presumption that you would be using Libsyn or Podbean or one of the, uh, 
the commonplace, but I'm looking forward to seeing how that works for you. Yeah, this plugin is going to be super easy. Um, it's going to do everything for us in terms of yeah, hosting it, RSS, and then putting it out to all of the podcatchers out there for us. So Awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and we will, I'm sure, have conversations about that. Um, yeah, I'm sure we will. It's, it's good mm-hmm. to have other podcasters to complain about podcasts, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and there's wonderful online communities for that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and wh- is there a, a hard launch date, a soft launch date? in mind at this point we're aiming for the second week of january right now i think that'll give us enough of a break after the christmas busyness to start getting down to it and record a couple and have them ready yeah um yeah it's 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 exciting and terrifying all at once um (laughs) it's a lot of fun and a lot of pressure absolutely (laughs) you've summed it up well as somebody uh, like you do who releases a podcast what every week yeah every week we're aiming Um, for every two weeks at the initial stages and mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes but it's a lot of work yeah, and that's, you know, you set the schedule and then you, you do it for two months and you go, nope, I can't do this or yep, that works. And you just sort of, you change it. And I don't know if this is similar for you in, in writing, you know, law books or, or presenting court cases or posting on social media. For me, I can't listen to my first season yeah, of podcasts. Uh, it's very tough. Uh, it upsets me greatly to yeah. hear how horrible they were. Oh, yeah. that's how I feel every time I read a paper I wrote in law school. It's yeah. just embarrassing. <laughs> you got you to let that go. We do that. It's exactly that way. You're right. It's everything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm still, uh, I mean, on a smaller note, I'm literally, we filed a, a factum in the Supreme Court, not the one that Camille and I did. And it's unbelievable that somehow like this major typos got into the first page. And it's like, as soon as I open the factum, which I'm really proud of generally, it's like, you can just see it. It's staring at me. <laughs> it's going, what are you doing? How could you let this in? And the worst part is it got replicated in every heading. Oh, it's in the heading. No. So it's in the table of contents, in the original heading, it's in the second heading. I'm like, oh my God. You just have to let it go. You yeah. just let it go and move on. <laughs> well, and that's the journalism. Um, I worked in prints for uh, 10 years and... Uh, we'd put out, you know, a 50 page, uh, 52 page newspaper weekly. Um, and there was three people plus spell check that would look at every single word in that newspaper and, and there'd still be a typo yeah. and you'd still kick yourself. Well, welcome. It's like lawyers. Yeah. It's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. It happens yeah. every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, although the difference is we try and use fewer words. Yeah. So, <laughs> fair enough. Um, now I want to talk a bit about animal law again, sort of in the broad sense. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot I see on social media, and I'm sure you see it as well, Shannon, is people say, why don't we just sue them? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and people seem to see that. As a, and I think this might be the law and orderisms, uh, or the, the, uh, at the very least, the American law system playing into our view of these. But people just say, well, why don't we just say it's animal cruelty and shut them down? Um, what is the general law on that? Like, is there, can we just say, hey, you know what? I don't like the way you did that. Lawsuit. Wow, that's a massive question that raises a lot of issues at once. All that is. I, I'd like the answer in yeah. 30 seconds. Uh, well, let me give you a preliminary comment on that. I think the fact that so many people see horrific situations of animal abuse and think that must be illegal. Why doesn't somebody do something? Why doesn't somebody sue them and shut them down? I think that really speaks to how out of step our legal system is with societal expectations and why we're really poised to make big changes in animal Mm -hmm. law. People want the law to be a certain way. It's not. And our job is to translate that into actual better results for animals. But Peter, maybe you want to talk about some of the major issues. I'll try to give the 30 second, uh, (laughs) the, 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 I don't know, the one minute uh, version of this. There are I, I think three, two or three major legal impediments to what you're saying, and they have nothing to do with animal law. They have to do with the way the legal system is structured. So first of all, um, when they say sue them, I'm not sure if they're distinguishing between criminal or civil, but it doesn't matter. Let's shut them down. The criminal side is more complicated, but the, the basic idea with the criminal side is that uh, the average person has no ability or power to really practically bring a prosecution. It has to be up to the state. And... The state, for a variety of reasons, is very reluctant, and this is becoming a pressing problem that I'm sure we're going to discuss in depth on one of our shows. The state is becoming more and more reluctant to bring animal cruelty prosecutions. And Mm -hmm. part of that, to be honest, this is just to show you how animals get slapped into the mix. I had a long discussion with a prosecutor in in Montreal recently, and it's if you read in your papers, you will read stories that have nothing to do with animals, but they have everything to do with animals. So I'm sure your listeners or anybody who's following the court system at all is familiar with a case called Jordan and a case in which because of unlawful delay, criminal cases are being thrown out of the courts. Mm -hmm. Now you read that story, 
You don't think about animals. I read that story. I think about animals because the bottom line is this. If we can't get robberies and murders into the courts because they're getting thrown out, the lower the case is on the totem pole, the more likely it's going to get thrown out. And the least important cases there are, I hate to break it to your listeners, are those involving animals. People, the, the, the prosecutors will weigh everything in the balance and they're going to say we're not going to proceed with animal cases because we have other cases to deal with. So you can see animal cases being resolved or dropped because there's just not enough resources to deal with them. So that's a serious, serious problem. One we'll discuss, I'm sure, at length in, in our podcast. So that's the criminal side. Very mm -hmm. hard to get criminal cases to court, no matter how meritorious they are. Only the worst of the worst of the worst make it in. And that's a problem. Yeah. On the civil side, there's a million obstacles, but the biggest obstacle is uh, a doctrine in our jurisdiction that they don't have in the U.S., and it is the doctrine of costs. Costs is the biggest impediment to bringing a lawsuit of any kind against uh, an animal user. So there, there are a variety of creative civil tools that can be used. The problem is that every time you launch a proceeding in this country, you are at risk of losing the proceeding and being hit with costs. Very few animal friendly agencies, if any, have the resources to withstand a cost order. Cost mm -hmm. orders are very expensive. It could be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a long proceeding. Correct. Wow. So the longer the proceeding, and of course the industries who are, you might be fighting in these things have resources beyond our capabilities. Yeah. And that is a real problem in terms of bringing actions of this sort, which is why animal justice has gotten incredibly creative in trying to use other types of proceedings where costs are not an issue. But straight up, I think somebody's doing something wrong. I want to craft some sort of legal action to try and do something about it. I better be prepared to pay the costs. Yeah, we might have a great case, but you never know what might happen in court. And you're on the hook for a lot of cash if you lose. If you're wrong. Yep. And then the third one, which is actually, I'd say, the biggest one, and it's a bit more complicated to explain, has to do, it's called a doctrine called standing. And the standing doctrine is really problematic for animals because the reason is the basic idea of standing to put it to your listeners, the, the, the clearest way to explain it is busybody shouldn't be able to go to court. So the idea that something is going wrong next door to me is not my problem, and I am not directly affected by that, so therefore I shouldn't be able to interfere in that. Well, the problem is that animals are not legal subjects. They're legal objects. So as a result, they don't have the personality to defend themselves. And that makes everybody who's not the owner of the animal a busybody. So essentially, when I try to go to court to advocate on behalf of an animal, it's very difficult to get the courts to recognize me and say, we're going to listen to what you have to say. And I can tell you right now that there is a legal proceeding going on in Edmonton. It's been going on for years. They're always trying. They're a group of very courageous activists who are willing to take on the cost risks, and they are willing to try and get Lucy the Elephant, who I'm sure everybody's heard of, moved out of Edmonton Zoo. And they have done this through a variety of review tools. One got as far as the Alberta Court of Appeal. They're back again. They lost again very recently at the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench. And the reason was the same. You have no ability to bring this proceeding, okay? And that's very difficult to surmount that goal of trying to say to get in because the courts actually quite understandably want to try and limit access to the court for busybodies because otherwise everybody would just go in theory and challenge a variety of things that don't affect them directly because they don't like them and the courts want to have a way to say no only things where you are directly affected can come before the courts so those three things together are very powerful tools against animals which is why we spend so much time trying to think of creative ways around them Long answer. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> no, I was just, I was, oh, I've got a good... No, I don't. Um, <laughs> it's, it is. It's a very complex issue. And I think that... Uh, well, frankly, that's one of the reasons the podcast is going to be so interesting. And one of the reasons I love this format is because you can talk for 20 minutes about that if you want to and get all of it across. Whereas in virtually any other form of media... You start to lose sure. people. Yeah, um, no one's going to read a Facebook no. post with all the information Peter just provided. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but those who are genuinely interested will now have that resource uh, to go to. And that's one of the aspects I want to, to touch on. And you brought this up, Peter, talking about libel. And again, Shannon, you deal with this as often as I do. I also manage social media for the Fur Bears is the comments a lot of people will make when they're angry, they're upset. Mm -hmm. And you, you want to try and police it reasonably. Uh, maybe police isn't the right word in this context, but you want to try and manage it reasonably. Um, and there's some comments that are very directly violent. Um, and these are from animal uh, rights supporters. 
Uh, and, you know, you have to say, okay, well, we can't allow for too many violent comments. But one thing that I constantly worry about, and again, it's because of all of the time I've spent with, with the uh, newspaper lawyers drilling it into our heads, is if you make a comment on social media, um, let's say in the case, a perfect example is the um, Niagara Region veterinarian who was had his license revoked and was charged with multiple counts of animal cruelty, and then everything was pretty much dropped and he's good to go. A lot of very visceral reactions to that, which I think is very, very understandable. Um, but when people start making an aggressive comment, uh, let alone a violent one, can that play a role either in their personal life or when you then try and, if you do get a chance to go to courts, have that come back? Oh, yeah. I think it's a huge issue for the person who makes a comment. People can lose their jobs based on comments that they leave on internet posts. It happens regularly. And I think as employers are increasingly concerned about the public perception of their company, um, they're totally willing to fire employees who do cross the line and make death threats on Facebook. Yeah. So it's a huge issue. And I think for us as an organization, we uh, try to walk that dance, that, that fine line as well, like you do, and balance, you know, allowing people to represent their views, but deleting the comments that advocate for actual violence. And we see them a lot on, on posts, especially about individualized cases of cruelty against a cat or a dog. Mm -hmm. That really touches a nerve with people. And as an organization, we don't advocate for violence. In fact, we're uh, committed to nonviolence for all animals. That includes human animals. Yep. And, uh, we certainly would never allow a comment like that to stay up after we see it. Well, and then from the perspective of, um, you know, in a, a hypothetical at this point, because I cer cer uh, certainly don't know the law on this or the case law on this, but let's say a, a case is moving forward, be it criminal or civil, uh, someone stands accused of animal cruelty and they show well, you know, look at the response that's happening. Um, can that weigh in their favor in some way uh, that they can show the potential for threats against them or that they have had, uh, um, I, I, I want to say deleterious, but I don't, that's not a word. Uh, is it a word? Yeah, yeah, that's a word. All right. But you're is saying right? like negative impacts yes. on their own lives based uh, on I'm internet comments. I'm trying to sound comments. smart, really, and it's not <laughs> working. Uh, but yeah, like, is that a, a real concern then? that, you know, all of these people are saying these horrible things about me on the internet, and here I stand accused. Can that play into it? P pretty remote. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed. I mean, it's it's nothing compared to what, e even the extent of the vitriol. I mean, I'm representing some criminal accused who face way, way more than any animal activist community can put together, and mm. the courts let you go anyway. I mean, we're talking about sexual abusers, we're talking about murderers, we're talking about terrible people who are getting, you know, the media lights up as well as social media, and it's like, you know, I've, I've had clients suffer actual violence, not threats of violence, so yeah. I mean, I just, it's hard to imagine the legal proceeding being sidetracked. There's no question that it could affect, affect in some way in a, in, a, in a hypothetical case if the furor got really intense. There's no question it could affect, but the court would deal with it. I wouldn't worry about the proceeding being lost or anything like that. No, it, and it, it does remind me of something interesting that happened recently, though. The, the, the pig trial. Anita Crines, of mm -hmm. course, was charged with criminal mischief for giving water to thirsty, suffering pigs who were about to be slaughtered. And as I'm sure many of your listeners were following, it uh, went to court for a multi-month trial. There were many return dates, many court dates, many news stories, and many people attending yeah. her court hearings every single day. Uh, the courtroom was packed. People were sitting on the floor. The judge allowed them to do so. It was like nothing I've ever seen. In his judgment, he acquitted her. He noted that there was an extreme amount of interest from the public in this case, and that that was laudable. But he also said he wished that there was such attention on the second-degree murder preliminary hearing that was happening next door. So I think sometimes even the intense amount of scrutiny that these cases can attract can even backfire in the minds of judges who think, well, maybe animal issues just aren't that serious. Why don't mm. these people care more about the humans who are victims in the court system? It's an interesting thought, and I, I think it's certainly something that we as advocates deal with. I know I all frequently get the question is, why do you care so much about these coyotes? What about the starving people and, you know, living in Hamilton? Well, there's people sleeping on we, the street. We've all had these questions yeah, every and, day. <laughs> and the simple answer is I do care about them, and I do donate to the local charities and give them meals and do everything I can reasonably, as well as caring about coyotes. But it's... It's a very interesting uh, situation, and I actually have a note about blowback on these cases, although this, I would say, is more from the public perspective, and I think 
Um, you know, a good example could be uh, Anita's case. Another one is your work with the Vancouver Aquarium, or not with the Vancouver Aquarium. <laughs> Against. <sorry. laughs> yeah, uh, maybe the other side of that. Uh, but is there ever any blowback effect? Uh, so people seeing this and being pushed into a, a position of cognitive dissonance or being pushed into a conversation they simply don't want to have and pushing back harder or digging their heels in more to their positions. Uh, I see like I see that on social media, hmm. but do you see that in the public as a whole as a result of the casework? Hmm. I, I think there is there is always that risk. There's no question that there is a, 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 this one of the reasons why I think animal justice exists, actually. And I think that's one of the reasons why some of these organizations and sort of the work that I do. So just, just maybe this I don't, I don't know how well this answers the question, but maybe it does. But so so I, I don't I don't protest. I'm not an activist. Mm -hmm. I don't go down. I don't stand in front of the first door. I have never been to protest. And that's a, a very deliberate choice. That is not, not that I'm not sympathetic to the protesters or that I, I don't want to protest. But I don't do that because I don't, I feel like we all have different roles to play in what we're trying to do. And my role is very specific. There are very few professors out there who can discuss these things and can receive a, a different type of audience. Mm -hmm. So there's one, there are the activists who are, who are complaining and going to these trials and, I'm all for it. Great, go. But but I won't be going with you because that's really not my role, and I don't think that's animal justice role to be that voice. Our voice is to really explain and critique the laws that make these results possible. And I think the best way that we can do that is by focusing on what it is that we do. So if this noise is going on around these things, that's great. I, I have no problem with that noise. It doesn't affect what I do. But when I was talking about the trial, the Anita, Anita Krein's trial, I always get her name wrong because it's so... The spelling. You got so it right this time. Okay, I went with Crines. Yeah, and and it's like so. I, I had I I if you watch my videos on it, they are entirely dispassionate. I don't even talk about the pigs. I'm not I'm not there to talk about the pigs. I'm not there yeah. to talk about where was she doing the right or the wrong thing morally. I'm just there to explain what the law is and why the law actually works in her favor and why that's important to point out and why that it's important that the law develop in a way that it respects what it is that she's doing. So it's like that is our role. So when we're discussing these things, you'll probably notice in the podcast going forward, it's not that I don't have personal issues issues on this, and I'm sure Camille does too. We both have personal views, and we could probably get sidetracked, and I'm sure occasionally we will, because it's just inevitable. Yeah. But most of the time, it's not my interest. I want to be discussing the things in the way that I was putting them to you previously. Mm -hmm. You know, These are the legal positions. These are why things work out the way. Here's where we think the law needs to evolve so we can get better results. That is what I see as, as my primary goal. And I, I came to that conclusion a long time ago. I was like, there's just no, there are not enough people doing what I'm doing. There are lots of people doing the other stuff, and that's great. I hope we get more and more of them, but we need to do something different. And I think you'll see a bit of a contrast between me and Peter as well, because I do go to protests still, and I mm -hmm. do have my sort of foot in the activism side of things as well. And uh, some of the work that animal justice does really helps translate that sentiment that you see with activists on the ground and just regular people who are opening their hearts to com compassionate positions and translate that, those social norms into the law. So I think it's going to be a good balance of hosting. Yeah, it will certainly uh, provide a, a wonderful uh, dichotomy in that sense of sort of the the legal facts and the the uh, compassionate passion of activism and how they come together. And that is the, the final question um, for this segment is when people are upset, when people are angry, um, we'll use the example of the, the Niagara veterinarian uh, as an example, is there seems to be a very clear law, right? That like, you, you have broken this law. It looks that way to pretty much anybody with two eyes. Um, and there's all kinds of what I would imagine is politicking behind the, uh, the Crown's decision to drop charges or not pursue charges. Um, when people are in that position and they're in between where the two of you are in that very conversation, let's say, so there is the what looks like a pretty straightforward legal case backed by the very, I am angry about this, I'm upset by this, where can they turn that? And I feel animal justice is in that very interesting perspective of you, you have the, the very hard legal facts and then you have the, the support for activism. And I know, Shannon, you're very involved with a lot of that as well. Um, what does animal just, justice recommend to advocates or even just animal lovers who find themselves in that awkward position of the law should be doing something but isn't and I still want to do something? 
I think that's a really important question. I'm glad you brought it up because most of our listeners, most of our supporters are not lawyers and don't have legal training and can't do this type of work. And that's reflective of the general public. But we all have a voice. And one of the fundamental problems that's led to the situation where animals don't get the treatment that they deserve under the law, sometimes the laws are broken, but sometimes the laws are fine and they're just not, exo uh, just not enforced well. One of those fundamental problems is that politicians, judges, other political actors don't perceive the constituency of people that care about animals as a politically powerful group that can drive change and affect those people who are decision makers. So the prime example of this is members of parliament or members of provincial parliament or city mm -hmm. councillors who may uh, wish to vote the wrong way on an animal issue and, and roll back protections or avoid supporting a bill like C-246 that would provide protections. The reason that they feel free to do this is that they don't feel that their jobs are going to be threatened by uh, the fact that they voted the wrong way. They don't think they're going to lose an election. And we have to show them that there are enough people out there who do want this change for animals, who do care about these issues, and who do vote on animal issues. So I, when we hear frustrated individuals coming forward after the Dr. Recchi charges were withdrawn, for instance, or after C246 was voted down, mm -hmm. I think that where people have to turn is to those decision makers and show them that there's support out there for these issues, meet with politicians regularly all, at all levels of government, meet with your MP, meet with your MPP, meet with your city councillor, bring friends with them, show them that there's people out there that want to see stuff happening on animals, show them that you're prepared to volunteer for them on a campaign, that you're prepared to support them, to donate to them, to spread the word, to really do what you can to help animal-friendly politicians win and go after those who wrote the wrong way on animal issues. I like that you call it the wrong way on animal issues. <laughs> there's only one right, right way, and that's towards more protections. To learn more about animal justice and get updates on their new Paw and Order podcast, visit their website at animaljustice.ca or follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That's the show for this week, folks. I want to thank all of you for listening and remind you to visit patreon.com slash Defender Radio to get started as a patron for exclusive bonus content and to support the show. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter at Defender Radio and Instagram at Howie Michael to find out about upcoming interviews, see adorable pictures of my dogs, and join me on Adventures in Hamilton. Until next time, this is Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears reminding you to stay informed and stay strong. <laughs> <laughs>